lecture. Uh, and uh, it is actually my psychological testament. Uh, I've been a psychologist for 40 years. And now I have to ask to summarize it in 40 minutes. Uh, well, I, I do my best. Uh, my first idea for this lecture was actually to let you listen to the 13th string quartet of Dmitry Shostakovich. Uh, it takes about 20 minutes, so that's about two times. Uh, because this work of art is string quartet perfectly reflects, uh, well, my teaching philosophy and that can be expressed by the saying of uh, Chang Chu, Chinese uh, philosopher from the 4th century before the Common Era, and that is uh, the torch of chaos and doubt that is what a teacher steers by. And that is what I always try to do to, uh, well, to offer conflicting evidence, and uh, I hope that I have succeeded in that. Okay, that was the first, but I thought perhaps you were a little bit disappointed if you only heard a string quartet, beautiful one, by the way, uh, by Dmitry Shostakovich. Uh, then I had a second thought. Uh, I read a book a long time ago by uh, Nico Freda, and Nico Freda, a late professor here, and it was actually my first professor in Amsterdam when I was studying in 1969, so rather, <laughs> rather long time ago. Uh, and he, Freire asked me the question, what would happen if we closed down all psychology departments? <coughs> and the answer he gives is not that much. So that would be a little bit, that would be not enough for this lecture, because then I was ready now. So I decided for a uh, rather classic uh, lecture title, An Alcoholic Go Gun Straight in Psychology. Uh, um, by the way, I borrowed this, tour, this term, uh, uh, alcoholic, from uh, Sachi, an art collector, uh, to describe his uh, art prediction. And actually, uh, perhaps you ever know, ever heard of the Stendhal uh, syndrome, that is suffering because of too high levels of exposure to art. And I guess I meet all the diagnostic criteria for that disorder. <laughs> um, in any case, so an alcoholic, but gone astray, and that has to do with the fact that uh, my choice for psychology was actually a forced one. I started as a, on a training college for teachers, uh, in the beginning of the 60s, and after that I decided to go to university, but I had only three choices, and it was uh, <coughs> pedagogics, <coughs> it was Dutch studies, <coughs> it was psychology. And uh, well, actually I chose the lesser of the three evils, and that is the reason why I am a psychologist <coughs> today. Okay. Preparing this lecture, uh, I was looking around a little bit in my library and uh, I stumbled on two books, one by uh, Piet Fromm, a late professor in psychology on the UU, and that book was called Down with Psychology. And another one by the already mentioned, aforementioned Freda, uh, that was called Psychology Makes Sense. And actually, I have to admit that I am, well, tossed between those two titles. Is it a relevant science, yes or no? Uh, in any case, uh, psychology was a forced marriage, you might say, but I had always, during that time, that 40 years, a mistress, and as an exception to the rule, it was a faithful mistress, and that was art. Um, so my lecture will be uh, structured as follows. I will start with psychology in general, some 
problems I have in psychology, then I uh, turn to my own domain, and that is the lifespan development of psychology, and I will try to offer you some, well, in my opinion, uh, important findings in that domain. And thirdly, uh, finally, I will uh, say something about the relationship between art and science. Science, my past, and art, my future, more or less. Okay, so then my mistress becomes official. Okay, uh, starting with uh, the first point, uh, well, I've made some slides. Uh, here you see the circle, by the way, already. <laughs> it's about the lifespan, my lifespan. This is the way I started in 1948. And this is when I was a student in Amsterdam studying psychology, and well, this is a rather recent one. Uh, and in any case, too, is a cigarette. Here I have not start yet. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, so three, uh, three parts. I will start with uh, the introduction. Uh, I will discuss uh, four difficult or problematic uh, aspects in uh, psychology. Uh, well, you, you will see. Uh, starting with Dr. Freda. Freda, as well as Strong, were rather critical about the relevance and the possibilities and the limitations of psychology. Now, actually, Fromm was the most, the most skeptical one. Uh, although, according to him, there was one solution to uh, save psychology from uh, further going down, and that was uh, modesty. Modesty in the aims of psychology, uh, modesty in the questions asked, etc., etc. But in any case, he was uh, uh, an enemy of broad world views of uh, all kinds of schools, dogmatic schools, normative schools, and that were at that time in the 60s, 70s, critical psychology, Marxist psychology, uh, humanistic psychology. Well, nowadays we have more or less the same, but under other names. And in any case, it was heavily opposed to that. Freida was a little bit more positive. Uh, actually, uh, he suggested that psychology had not made a better world in general, but in any case, without psychology, it would have been worse. Uh, and the trick is a little bit that he thought that the relevance of psychology was more a kind of larpular relevance. It is very interesting. So psychology should be guided by curiosity. Uh, but his rather lenient uh, view, well, I have some doubts. Uh, I will give you an example. Uh, in the past, uh, teachers, elementary school teachers later, and in the higher levels of education had some problems with some students, some pupils. Uh, but usually they could manage it. Nowadays, there is an ever-increasing number of pupils, of children, with uh, officially diagnosed disorders uh, with officially approved medication and with the pharmaceutical industry uh, with huge profits. So if that is progression, well, I choose for something else. Uh, okay. What did I learn in those 40 years uh, of uh, my career? Uh, well, actually, I don't know. In any case, a lot of things in a more negative sense. Uh, for instance, deciding what is irrelevant. And there has been a lot of irrelevance in psychology with respect to research questions, for instance. Uh, and, but the most important thing I actually learned was that I understood less and less of human behavior. That is the main thing I learned. Uh, okay, some concerns in general. Uh, I will discuss five 
problems in psychology. Uh, I will, well, only mention a little bit, some few remarks. But uh, in any case, they represent uh, the things that, well, I'm a little bit, uh, I think, which are a little bit dangerous. First of all, of course, the standard problem in psychology, and that is the heart problem. Uh, so, the relationship between body and mind. Well, it has been tackled by philosophers, uh, nowadays uh, by neuroscientists, by psychologists, but all the proposed solutions for that problem have been of no avail. Well, actually, my first encounter with that body and mind problem was uh, in my <coughs> study with the book of uh, Gilbert Ryle, The Concept of Mind. And since that, since that book, according to me, we have we didn't come one step further in the direction of the solution, but perhaps because we posed the wrong question. Uh, the conclusion actually is that psychology, in my opinion, should only deal with behavior. That's the only thing we have, and the rest is, well, to exaggerate a little bit, uh, speculation. Uh, an example, pain. A well-known phenomenon, but pain itself is, we cannot study it. We can only see the behavioral or the neurological correlates of pain. Pain itself is elusive. <coughs> okay, uh, and even when we restrict ourselves to behavior, then it is difficult enough because of the infinite number of determinants of that behavior. Um, okay, so the subject of psychology is something that we hardly can cross. Okay, second reason, and that is something also something special for psychology, is that everybody considers him or herself as an expert. It is like your behavior, you are human, so you can say something, you can give your opinion about psychological theories. Um, so I envy actually scientists who deal with, uh, well, stars, insects, mathematical walls, uh, because nobody protests again, for instance, the uh, finding the report of the CERN that the Higgs particle, that there was some support for the existence of the Higgs particle. Uh, but look at psychology, look at Freud. Well, I'm not Freudian, but poor Sigmund, he was attacked from all sides because of his <coughs> ideas by Christians, by feminists, by anti-Semites. So it was a horrible problem. And more recently, think of the study by Leibert about uh, free will, or according to uh, Leibert, the absence of it. Uh, a lot of people are opposed to it because they don't like the answer. And that is what uh, I learned in the philosophy, an argumentum of consequential. I don't like, I don't like the outcome, so it is not true. Okay, uh, the third pitfall, uh, and that is also, well, all the pitfalls are something of psychology. Uh, Okay, psychology try to uh, formulate psychological laws. But there's a small problem. As soon as the law is formulated, it changes our behavior, and thereby the law again. Uh, to give you an example, uh, perhaps you know the phenomenon of uh, cognitive dissonance. Well, perhaps you've read about it, books about it. Knowing principles behind cognitive dissonance changes your behavior and thereby the psychological law. And that is not the case with the Higgs particle. In any case, as far as I know. Uh, okay, and then the fourth problem, and that is perhaps one of the most difficult things in psychology, uh, in my opinion, is a rather dangerous science. Uh, dangerous because it is about human behavior and 
knowledge is associated with improvement. So a lot of psychologists are trying to improve human behavior, and that is a little bit dangerous. Uh, when we look at uh, medicine, for instance, then we have uh, all kind of uh, uh, medication that helps us to endure pain. Uh, no cocaine, for instance, uh, when you go to the dentist for local anesthesia, you get so that is better than a pain stick. Uh, so some few years ago, a pain stick for uh, that was in the 18th century, something like that. And when the pain became undurable, they could put their keys in that stick. But actually, I prefer no cocaine. So that is an improvement. But in the case of human behavior, it's a little bit tricky. Uh, because when you try to improve human behavior to, inc well, to let happiness increase, to uh, provide a better life for people, then uh, you enter a very uh, dangerous domain. Uh, combined with the fact that uh, knowledge in psychology is often triggered a kind of conditioned reflex, you have some knowledge and then immediately start with some training or something like that. Uh, I witnessed that in the, in the 70s, for instance with uh, creativity, in the 70s creativity was very uh, popular concept, everybody creative, everybody an artist, a lot of training uh, sessions in, uh, in uh, creativity, actually the outcome was rather disappointing. If not. And nowadays there are even programs for wisdom. Sternberg in the uh, States is developing all kinds of programs, training programs to stimulate wisdom. Well, as such, there is uh, no problem, but uh, looking at uh, the results of good intentions, that is often uh, uh, not very, uh, not very attractive. <coughs> okay, uh, and by the way, the side effect of all those uh, hypes in psychology and all kind of uh, trials we human behavior and all those schools is that I am put a little bit in the corner, uh, look at uh, humanistic psychology in the past, apparently I'm inhuman, look at critical psychology, uh, apparently I'm uncritical, and nowadays uh, look at positive psychology, apparently I'm a negative psychologist. Well, let it be, I accept this as a proud nickname. Okay, and then finally, a last uh, small problem is uh, that during my career, what, what has struck me most is that uh, there is sometimes a kind of perverse attention for the abnormal, for things that are rare. Uh, so when I discuss in class, for instance, uh, all kind of rather rare uh, disorders like pica or, uh, or uh, Mania or Gilles de la Tourette disorder. Well, students are all ears. But when I start to tell something about the miracle, the mystery of uh, the fact that when we want to uh, get something out of our memory, to find a piece of knowledge in that huge memory store, then a lot of students are looking what is about. Uh, by the way, that is not a very uh, recent phenomenon. I have here a copy from a very old book, the oldest book I have uh, at home in my library, uh, published in uh, the middle of the 17th century, and it is uh, part theology and a part psychology. Um, and that book is called A Verhandeling van de Herstocht van de Mogelijkheden van de Zieden des Mensen. In English, a thing about the passion and the capacity of the human soul. And there you can find uh, this 
citation. If you can read the old Dutch, you find it there. Uh, so, okay, read it, let only one child be born with six fingers or with one limb more than usual. We are very astonished at one superb thing that at all that is natural. Nobody looks with surprise at the sun only when there is a sort of mix. So, absolutely normal is it for humans that they are more surprised at new than at normal things. And it is often, there are often the normal things that are very interesting in psychology. Okay, in sum, I can draw the following conclusions. Uh, actually, one of the things, one of the things I learned in a course of social psychology that you have to draw the conclusions always yourself because the audience draws the wrong conclusions. So here you find it. Uh, skeptical as, as possible with respect to mental phenomena, you can only observe behavior. Be modest, so I guess the expectations about possibilities of psychology should be a little bit downwards. Uh, trying to improve behavior implies norms about what is better, and looking at human history, we know that the way to hell is paid with good intentions. Okay. And then look for the mystery in the normal phenomena instead of focusing on all kinds of horrible, abnormal, rare things. Okay, this far psychology in general, and then I will jump to my more well known uh, area, and that is lifespan developmental psychology. Uh, we all start in this way. And we end in this way. By the way, it's the, the grave of Dmitry Shostakovich in Moscow. <laughs> okay. Uh, when you remember the slide, the first slide, there was a drawing by Antonis, a Dutch uh, painter, <coughs> 16th century. And on that uh, painting, it was a uh, candle. More and more from the moment we are born, we start dying. Actually, that's a little bit the domain of lifespan development of psychology. Um, changes that occur between birth and death. And it's a lot. Okay, um, I will uh, discuss four uh, aspects of findings in development psychology that are, according to me, very important. And I will start with uh, this well, formula. Uh, behavioral change is a function of age, period, cohort effects, and individual. In other words, change squared. I will uh, explain that later. Uh, to illustrate a little bit, this formula, so that our development is a function of age and historical changes and characteristics of cohorts, so groups of people born at the same time. Uh, as an example, have a look at, uh, or when I visit a concert hall in Amsterdam, I often go to the Musikgebouw A, and when you look at the visitors at public there, then one thing is clear, they are old. Very old. <laughs> the only thing you see is gray hair and bald heads. Okay. That suggests a kind of relationship between age and visiting concerts. Uh, in any case, this kind of concert. But that's a little bit uh, tricky because the question is how will that concert hall look like in, say, for instance, 50 years. When preferences for classical music is an age-related phenomenon, then no, there will be no problem. But there is some evidence that it might be a cohort effect. So in any case, people born before, say, 1960 have more preference for classical music than other forms. So that implies that that apparently that age effect 
now visible in the concert halls and in museums, is actual, actually a cohort tank and not an age tank. Uh, another example look at uh, elections. Well, you see some change in the political, uh, the political domain, changes from left to right, etc. And the question is a little bit, uh, is that an age fact? Or has it to do with historical changes? Or is it a cohort fact? Uh, in my time, it was quite simple. In the 60s, young was left and red, and old was conservative, and a member of some Christian party or liberal party. But nowadays, it's not that simple. So apparently, it is not an age effect, but it has to do with characteristics of a group of people born in a certain period of time. So age, period, and court are closely interrelated, and it's very difficult to find which factor contributes to what. Uh, in any case, we try to do that. Uh, An example, by the way, well, another example of such a core a period effect that is uh, this well known phenomenon, fit effect. Uh, what you see here, I will explain a little bit without going into details. In two points of time, the intelligence level of people were measured. And what you see here is are five age groups. This is the level of intelligence. These are two periods in time with a gap of about 50 years. And what you can see clearly are two things. First of all, these new cohorts outperform every age group from 1940. And there's second important finding that when you look at the gap between the old 65 and the young here in 1940, that gap is much bigger than the gap between young and old in 1990. So the general level has increased and there has been something changed in the age relatedness of uh, intelligence. In any case, it is not an age effect, this is clearly a period effect. We are becoming better, in any case, in making intelligence tests. Okay. Um, in principle, all those three factors are very important, age, period, and core. But when I start studying developmental psychology, the only <coughs> attention, there was only attention paid to age. And we didn't hear anything about period and forward. Uh, so the three are very important. And by the way, that doesn't mean that age as such is not a period predictor and that it is not a concern of people. Uh, I will give uh, two examples. First, something about the concern of people with respect to their age. What you see here is uh, three types of age. Actual, the black dots, actual chronological age. The gray dots, the subjective age, how old you feel. <coughs> and the white dots are, if you mean, ideal age of people. So you are 50, you want to be, and you feel okay. <laughs> Only have a look at the uh, here, the Netherlands, the sample of people of uh, beginning 50, they felt as if they were 45, so five years younger, and their ideal age was about 40, so a gap of 10 years. So, actually, I think that uh, people are very much concerned about their age. Uh, sometimes you see here uh, huge gaps, about 20 years. And by the way, this is very nice. Uh, 
Nigeria, almost no difference between how old you are, how old you feel, and how old uh, you want to be. The relevance of age is also visible in this kind of pictures, <coughs> which depict the fact that age is actually structuring our society. What means that, and that means that uh, there are specific expectations about age. And this is a very popular theme, the unequal pair. Uh, this is painted by Sandra Dunn. Uh, and here you see a young lady, a young man that is normal, but that is an old man who is trying with the money and jewels to uh, get between the two. By the way, uh, to French, we, there's also something for females here. The same trick, a young couple and the old one tries to interfere. Uh, and we become always a little bit uneasy. And to give a more recent example, when you see this, one of the mistresses of uh, Berlusconi, uh, I've forgotten the name, uh, but in any case, everybody becomes a little bit uneasy when seeing that huge age gap. And apparently, it is very important that there are strict rules about uh, a possible age difference, and this is apparently too big. Okay, age, period, and core effects. The second uh, general point I want to general finding I want to uh, present has to do with uh, what is often called the nature nurture debate. Um, when I I also look in, in old uh, developmental psychology handbooks, and there the problem is uh, presented in a rather simple way. We develop, and the way we develop that is determined by our genes and or the environment, or the combination of the two. In most cases, the combination of both. Uh, but this way of approaching the problem of nature and nurture is actually way too simple, because it supposes that there are two separate elements, our genes and the environment. And that is obviously not the case that they are separate ones. And therefore, I go to my, one of my favorite psychologists, and that is Sandra Scar. And Sandra Scar has presented a model in which genes and environment interact. Actually, to be more precise, according to Scar, genes drive our environment. So, different people will experience the environment different ways. So the same uh, environment has differential effects depending on uh, your genetic makeup. Uh, that's the first thing. The second thing in theory has to do with the fact that, and that is more uh, directed to uh, the environment, and that is the concept of a good enough environment. And that is an important concept with important implications. What does she mean with a good enough environment? Uh, I can best illustrate it with this three-dimensional graph. Uh, when we look at the uh, development of this phenotype, high, low, this is the quality of the environment, low and high, and this is our genotype, low and high, or, well, uh, very well being well equipped in genetic order sense and being bad equipped in a general <coughs> sense. Okay, have a look at uh, this graph and you see that in the beginning there is a positive relationship between the quality of the environment, so how many possibilities to an environment, is an environment stimulating, etc. etc and the actual phenotype, so the actual characteristics of an individual. But 
then it levels off on all levels of the genotype from low to high, and that has to do with that aforementioned good enough environment. Triggers a little bit that from this point, so when the quality <coughs> of the environment has come to very bad, very adverse conditions in which you grow up, you're a little bit better. At this point, according to uh, SCAR, the conditions are good enough. And every further improvement of the environment doesn't attribute, or doesn't attribute more to, well, variance in the phenotype. Um, to give a very simple practical example, look at children within one family. They are raised in the same environment. They have the same parents, the same opportunities, etc., etc. Yet the variance, the within family variance, is often much bigger <coughs> than the between family variance, given that families, and that's normally the case, operate within that good enough domain. So here it makes a difference. After that, it is important. And it has, as I said, important implications. Look, for instance, at raising children. According to SCAR, parents only need to provide that basic requirements, and the rest is irrelevant. So all kind of parenting styles doesn't matter at all. Look at education. An institution must provide students with a good enough learning environment and all kind of educational philosophies and all that kind of thing doesn't have an influence on the variance in the phenotype, in this case academic performance of the students, because our genes drive <coughs> environment. And uh, to explain that we drive the environment bit or experience. Uh, first of all, every individual evokes certain responses from his or her environment. And that can of course, explain the variance within the family. And secondly, everybody with a certain genetic makeup looks for a certain niche in his environment with fitch with which fits his or her phenotype, uh, genotype, sorry. Uh, so everybody looks for his own place in which he can prosper. And it can be looking, for instance, at the UCU. People with different characteristics will look for different things in that same environment for everybody. And that is the difference that SCAR makes between the shared environment objective characteristics, for instance, the UCU, and the unshared environment, and that is what an individual <coughs> makes of it. Okay, SCAR. Uh, a third thing that I found interesting in developmental psychology, and that has to do more with motivational aspects of the lifespan, and that is the theory of Parkinson, a useful theory which describes that as you become older, step by step, your goals will change. And they will change in a specific direction, and that change in goals, what is important for you in life, has to do with our time perspective. When you are young, so in the beginning of your <coughs> lifespan, the future is open, so people make a choice for goals which open that future. So they look for new information, which might be useful in the future. They look for new social contacts, might be useful in the future. So they have an open uh, attitude towards everything, every stimuli. Okay. Then you get a little bit older and older and older, and then you realize at some moment, that is not from one day to another, that the future is not 
limited. And what do we have to do then? Uh, actually, people become a little bit more uh, risk avoiding. When you uh, have not much time to go, then it's not very wise to invest a lot in experimenting. Then you make a choice for things that have proven to be very nice, proven to be very uh, providing comfort, etc. etc. So you become less risky. That doesn't imply that you become less curious. But, well, <coughs> take for instance, you are sentenced to death and you have a choice for a final meal, a gallows meal. I guess you will make a choice for something of which you know that you like it and that you will avoid all kind of ex experiments uh, with all kind of new types of food. No, you take no risk. And that's actually also going on in life, but then at a, a less dramatic uh, pace. Okay, and then the final thing I found very interesting and useful. Actually, it's a very sad graph. Perhaps the saddest <coughs> graph the last 20 of mental psychology. It's a very simple one. What you see here is a graph that depicts things that are remembered, are told by older people, very old people, about their own lives. So, reflecting what they think is or was important in their life. Okay, this is the age at the moment when you eat into place, <coughs> and this is the percentage of memories. Okay, have a good look and become sad. <laughs> When you look here, then you see that most memories are to be found, are, which are told, are to be found between, say, 15 and 25. After that, it drops to a very low level, almost nothing. And then, in the end, totally the top, and that is a normal recency effect. So, ask people what was important in their life to give a kind of impression of their life. They start especially telling all kind of first experiences, first love, oh first job, etc., etc. Then nothing happens again. <laughs> and then the last thing they tell is that, well, one year ago I broke my hip. I died or something like that. And this is the biggest part of your life. And that sinks away. Okay, uh, to end this part with a more positive thing, well, this is But in any case, this period is also very important, not only for what you remember about your life, but also it also, uh, well, determines partly, a huge part, your preferences. Preferences, for instance, for music reference for literature and well I had a look in my library and here you find some I will not go through them all but this was the music in my group and I have a very strong liking for it. Let's call America.
Uh, by the way, not only music, only also literature. Still my favorite writers are the writers I read when I was around 20, for instance. Hermans, for the Netherlands, and Céline, a French writer. Okay, uh, here you find again the, the conclusions change over the lifespan is a function of age period core and individual differences, genes drive experience, time to <coughs> drive goals, and most memories about life between 25, 35, or a little bit earlier. The rest has gone. Okay, then I come to the last part, and that has to do with the relationship between art and science. And as a kind of bridge, I will present you some metaphors of the lifespan uh, which you can find in art. Uh, so metaphors are kind of directly between art and lifespan in the psychology. A popular theme in art. Uh, first, I will present a few examples <coughs> of metaphors with implicit assumptions about the course of the lifespan, and then I will present my favorite my favorite metaphor is the rope of life, the leather, the wheel, and a neutral one. Okay, first of all, implicit assumptions, and that is seen in this kind of depictions of the lifespan. There is a there is progression in the beginning and decline in the end, and that is the, the so-called hill model. And you find several examples of that just to show you a few to get an idea. Uh, staircase, here, a beautiful one by Breu. Here you see that's not a staircase, but the lifespan as a, well, kind of a architectural development, and here is the end of life, ruins. <laughs> and here, death standing there near the grave. Well, that is a depiction of lifespan in which life is seen as progression, stability, and then decline. And I actually don't like it, although sometimes it provides very nice summaries of the lifespan, as in this uh, case, a lot of uh, stairs, but in Dutch it sounds much better. Youth, group of God, or youth, joy, old. <coughs> as a very short summary of the lifespan. But, as I said, I prefer better ones. Uh, the rope of life, the life is just a sequence of uh, rather unpredictable events depicted in the curves here in, uh, in the rope. And here you see a small uh, label with all kinds of events out there events from the life of Kavakov himself. So a rather unpredictable way in which the lifespan develops. This is also a beautiful one, the wheel of life. So beginning and end merge together. So we step actually from nothing to nothing. That is depicted in the wheel of life. Here, another one, the labyrinth. Everybody enters life and with the lever, everybody looks for the way towards the middle, and what you see there is that that is standing there waiting for you. So everybody takes another road and actually ends up in the middle. And then my most <laughs> favorite one, and that is by Baldwin Green, and that is a neutral one. Just here you see the second last page of women. And it is just a nice depiction of change without any implicit assumption about progression or decline. So if you go to the Leipzig, you uh, can see that. Okay, then I go to uh, art itself. Uh, actually, my basic assumption with respect to art is that art and science are actually the same. They have the same goals, but they try to reach it with other means. And I will try to uh, uh, explain that a little bit. <coughs> uh, first of all, 
I have to go to uh, this one. Uh, so R of sine is all different means. Uh, when we look at the functions of R and the functions of sines, then you can see that they coincide, actually. Uh, well, I'm not an expert now, but in any case, I thought of three effects of R on the perceiver. First of all, it can elicit experiences of beauty, whatever that may be. There is a good uh, definition by Stendhal. Uh, beauty is the promise of happiness. Okay, think about that. Very deep, uh, deep one. But in any case, beauty. And you find that in science too. You have beautiful experiments, you have beautiful theories, and by the way, also ugly ones. Okay, the second uh, function, effect of R and of science is that of bringing down <coughs> losing one's footing, uh, finding or looking for paradoxes. So, away from the normal way of thinking, looking at things at, from a different perspective, and then finally raising questions because of this mathematical character. Okay, some examples, otherwise we can't press all the graphs, right? This is beauty. In any case, it is the promise of happiness. This is, by the way, from Fleur, a small town uh, in France, in the north. Uneasiness in art. Uh, this is painted by Bugs from uh, an illustration he made for Wuthering Heights by Bronte. Uh, uh, and here, another uneasy one by a Dutch artist, Marlene Dumas. Makes, in any case, it makes me a little bit uneasy. Uh, by the way, it's on the basis of a poem by a very good poet, also from South Africa. Kleur uh, from Noit Alini, before I never comes alone. It makes you uneasy. And then elusiveness as a third function or effect. Uh, this photograph I took, or my wife took, in Paris. That is uh, a project by Anish Kapoor, British uh, artist. And what you see here is the Palais, uh, the Grand Palais filled completely with a, an enormous balloon, actually four balloons of about 30 meters height and about 70, 100 meters length. Okay, when you see that, you don't have an immediate answer of what it means, what it is supposed to mean. And uh, that is also sometimes the case with science. So beauty, a little bit uneasy and not knowing what it is exactly, uh, that are the points in which art and uh, science coincide. Uh, by the way, you don't find it on, not only in the visual arts, but uh, actually also in the musical, in, in music. Um, I will skip that because of the time. I see that I'm running a little bit out of time. Uh, oh, no. <coughs> I give one example of uneasiness because I promised you in the beginning something about the 13th three quarter. And here you are, here, a part of it. Uneasy music. Oh, no, that is not uneasy music. <laughs>
on your safe that you can <coughs> listen to it two times. Okay, <laughs> um, to uh, end up this uh, lecture, some uh, general uh, conclusions. I will skip this. Uh, art and science are closely related, uh, promoting questioning and questioning attitude. So it makes you think by the sometimes uh, unsettling effect of art. Uh, the repetition of the misconceptions and the importance of the normal phenomena. Okay, with respect to my own culture, uh, you see two, uh, two possibilities. Uh, one is drawing by Ira, cartoonist, uh, perhaps I am this one, actually, of course, I prefer this one by Metsu, the smoking <laughs> and <laughs> drinking. And I hope to end in this way. And finally, as I don't like official uh, uh, farewell parties, I've decided to uh, end with a musical, again a musical, final word, and that is Schubert's extension, and it has to do with the fact that uh, I prefer to slide away, side away. I will put it on the right track, because otherwise it's a little too long.